Cairo, August 1799. That Corsican runt! General Kleber shouts as he storms into the meeting with his generals. In his hand, he clutches a long letter from Bonaparte. It informs him that he's now in charge of the French forces in Egypt and offers detailed instructions for running the occupation. Napoleon, he's just learned, has returned to France, leaving Kleber with a deteriorating military situation. The British are preparing a land force, the Arabs are in open revolt, and the French army is undersupplied, depleted, and plague-stricken. Summarizing the situation, he tells his staff, That bugger has deserted us with his breeches full of shit! When we get back to Europe, we'll rub it in his face! But none of them will dare do so, for Napoleon is only three months away from ruling France, and Kleber won't make it back to Europe at all. Thanks so much to World Anvil for helping us forge today's historical tale. When the Directory heard that Napoleon had returned to France, their first instinct was to put him on trial, which seemed reasonable. After years of infrequent contact and ruling Egypt independently from their control, he'd suddenly abandoned his post without orders. Sure, they had discussed him coming back, but they definitely hadn't called for him. Yet any thoughts of punishment quickly disappeared on October 9th as Bonaparte's carriage pulled up outside and crowds thronged the streets, cheering for the hero of Egypt. He and his officers came in with style, displaying mameluk sabers, exotic sashes, and tanned complexions. Only a month later, the Directory, already weakened by intrigues among its members, fell to a coup, Napoleon himself being the chief plotter and beneficiary, and in the wake of this, he took up the position of First Consul, essentially a military dictator. You see, while the Egyptian campaign was a mess to anyone who'd witnessed it, Bonaparte had successfully managed to portray it through his letters and dispatches as a glorious campaign. And a large part of that was due to a group of men we've only touched on thus far in this series, the savants. Though the invasion of Egypt was for all intents and purposes a grab for colonies and resources, Napoleon's cadre of scientists, naturalists, geologists, and engineers had granted it a veneer of humanitarianism. France wasn't just taking territory, no, it was expanding knowledge. The irony, of course, was that the savants themselves were universally miserable and abused. Soldiers thought of them as useless, and there was widespread resentment against them from the beginning. The army incorrectly came to believe that these academics had been the ones to propose and lobby for the expedition, meaning troops blamed them for being stranded in Egypt. They also hilariously thought that the savants were looting treasures from the ancient tombs, meaning that soldiers frequently rifled through their baggage and sample jars, hoping to find gold. Yet the savants tried their best. They stayed with the army on the initial march to Cairo, and were subject to the outbreaks of blindness, extreme thirst, and Bedouin attacks. During the crossing of the desert, they made one of their first studies of new phenomena, investigating why soldiers sighted lakes on the horizon, only to see them disappear as they approached. Oh yeah. The first big study the French did was on mirages. And, you know, if you're thinking that modern historians probably like using that as a metaphor for the expedition as a whole, you'd be very right. But it was in Cairo where their work began in earnest. Told to find a suitable headquarters, they took over an abandoned Mamluk palace and renamed it the Egyptian Institute. This building would become a clearinghouse for information, a library to keep documents, a store for antiquities and samples, and a scientific institute. Savants would gather in the palace's former harems for lectures as they presented their findings via formal papers on everything from taxonomy of Egyptian wildlife to research into mummification. Savants also spread out over Egypt to pursue niche interests or specialties. One would collect new invertebrates and insects, while another visited the Red Sea ports to dredge up shells, starfish, and other small marine animals. And as the French army pursued Murad Bey into Upper Egypt, several savants came along in order to survey and draw the temple complexes of Luxor, Thebes, and a half dozen others. Most were abandoned, with the local population giving them a wide berth, and one had even been used to dump bodies of execution victims. But the scale drawings of these palaces and ink prints of their hieroglyphics would in many ways become more important than the artifacts they brought back to France. And of course, just before Napoleon's departure, engineers conducting restoration work on a fort uncovered an ancient Egyptian stele in three languages. The Rosetta Stone, the key to translating hieroglyphics. And let me tell you, that's enough of a story to warrant its own episode. I wonder when that will be happening. Wink. But not all of this work was meant to increase knowledge. The savants and artists were also part of the imperialist machine. 
When Napoleon took Cairo, it was that civilian compliment that built two massive victory arches out of wood and painted canvases to celebrate the victory at the Battle of the Pyramids. Savants ran the printing presses that spat out the all-important propaganda, and several accompanied Bonaparte to the port of Suez to survey the ancient canal that once connected the Red Sea with the Nile. It was Napoleon's dream to redredge that canal, deep enough to accommodate modern trading and naval vessels. And that was also what the savants were there for, to improve agriculture and make Egypt more productive as a French colony. Likewise, once the French were cut off by the Battle of the Nile, they were put to work manufacturing or finding replacements for any spare parts or other materials that they were no longer able to import from France. A group even created a sort of technological expo meant to overawe Egyptian leaders with the miracles of Western science. The argument being made was that the French were willing to bestow liberal government, technology, and infrastructure development in exchange for extracting Egypt's resources which might sound familiar if you're like a person who lives on Earth. The chronicler al Jabarti was present for this showcase and was impressed, apart from the demonstration of a hot air balloon which immediately caught fire and crashed among a crowd of screaming onlookers. And within months of Bonaparte's exit, it was clear that the French military situation was heading in a similar direction. General Kleber hashed out an agreement for a French withdrawal in January of 1800. But at the last minute, the British refused to sign it, and the Ottomans launched an enormous seaborne invasion. Though Kleber defeated it, a simultaneous revolt in Cairo and a fresh plague epidemic roiled the security situation for months, culminating when a 23-year-old student from Al-Azir assassinated Kleber. Command then fell to General Abdullah de Menu, who had converted to Islam after marrying an Egyptian teenager. Menu, still unrealistically optimistic about the possibilities of a French colony in Egypt, dragged the occupation out for another year before a British Ottoman force defeated him in Alexandria. Always dismissive of the savants, Menu did not object when the British insisted that, as part of the surrender, they would hand over all Egyptian antiquities to be taken to the British Museum. Now, originally, the British also insisted that all the savants' notes and drawings also be surrendered, but after the academics threatened to destroy the documents rather than turn them over, they were allowed to keep them. And these drawings, impressions, and studies would later be compiled into 37 volumes to make up the book Description of Egypt, at the time the largest book in the world. Its enormously detailed prints would, in particular, influence the exoticized Western view of Egypt up until the modern day, though that wasn't the savants' only legacy. Their Egyptian institute still exists as a center of Egyptology in Cairo today. The expedition also changed the course of Egyptian history. Muhammad Ali Pasha, one of the Ottoman commanders sent to eject the French in 1801, stayed, destroying the weakened Mamelukes and becoming the Ottoman governor of Egypt. Having witnessed French power, he, along with other Middle Eastern governments, embarked on a plan of reform and modernization and his family would govern the country until a revolutionary coup gained Egypt full independence in 1952. Napoleon, for his part, didn't really care about these changes on the ground. Egypt had served its purpose for him, for he'd rewritten the history of the expedition to suit his ever-increasing cult of personality. Paintings cast him as a heroic explorer, part scientist, part general, and, you know, never hinted that he lost 30,000 men in a failure that gained nothing for France. Yet he did gain something personally a taste for absolute power. The man who had ruled Egypt independently and referred to himself in proclamations as the great Sultan Bonaparte had found what it was like to have a crown. And if Egypt would not let him be king, perhaps France would have him as an emperor. And I gotta say, even with all of the historical revisions Napoleon was able to pull off throughout his career, I am just glad he didn't have super powerful storytelling tools like World Anvil at his disposal back in the day, or else we might all be speaking French. World Anvil is a beautifully crafted and award-winning tool set used by millions of world builders, writers, and gamers that can help you create, store, and organize all your ideas. And honestly, we just can't say enough good things about this tool set. I legit love it so much. You could use it to craft and run entire RPG campaigns while tracking things like timelines, family trees, and diplomatic relationships. Use awesome interactive maps to help bring your story to life. Collaborate with other writers to flesh out your world's lore and backstories. And then once everything is forged, you can easily share what you've built with your readers, your patrons, your players, or whoever you want. In other words, it's the exact tool set that lets me focus on the fun parts of world building, which is why I'm doing all this work in the first place. But in truth, it's not only for game masters. Players can actually use World Anvil to manage their characters across more than 45 
supported RPG systems, complete with interactive character sheets, inventory management, linked adventure journals, and even the ability to receive private messages from the GM, sharing information that only your character gets to know. <laughs> Sorry. World Anvil is also super popular with writers and novelists who use its proprietary software to not only pen their stories, right, but also develop world bibles, craft easily searchable categories to group characters, locations, or chapters, work with editors across multiple documents, and even export their final work to a variety of industry standard formats for legit publishing. I mean, this thing really kind of does it all. So if you want to be able to create, store, and organize all of your awesome ideas, and honestly have a great time doing it, you can actually try World Anvil absolutely free. But you can also, for a limited time, receive 40% off any annual membership that unlocks a ton of cool perks by using the code extra credits. Then not only will you be able to create and share all of your awesome worlds, but you'll also be directly helping out us in the world of EC in the process, which is very sweet. And you know what? You get a point of inspiration for that. Once again, that is code extra credits for 40% off any annual membership, and we can't wait to see what worlds you build. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 